Today, we're working with paper. To start, you can download everything I made in this video to use in any project. And I'm even giving an entire font and some of the image assets for free. And you don't just need After Effects. These can easily be used on their own in Premiere, Resolve, Final Cut, or any other editing app. I'll get into that later in the video, but for now, let me show what we're actually going for. Ali Abdal's YouTube Shorts are notorious for having these paper uncrumpling assets to showcase the topic he's discussing. The assets themselves are really unique, and they're actually pretty hard to find online. They work really well together, especially when combined with background and overlay textures. Well, as a personal challenge, I set out not only to make my own, but but to demystify the process for you as well, for both creating the assets from scratch and actually animating like Ollie. After we make the assets, I'll show exactly how I made the title screen you're about to see right now. Everything starts with asset preparation. There's a few tips I have depending on what you're creating. For fonts, I used Google Fonts and laid everything out in a simple Google Doc. One major thing to make sure is that your assets are big enough so that when you cut them down and crumple them, you have enough real estate to work with. For images, you can find them literally anywhere or even take them yourself. I went to Unsplash, Pexels, and I even used some Adobe Firefly for AI image generation on a few of them. But keep in mind two main rules. The images should be relatively simple to cut out, so nothing with ridiculous gaps and lines, and they should be unobstructed by anything in the foreground. You can take your images and print them out directly, but I went with an extra step of processing them in Photoshop to crop unnecessary pixels and to do any image touch-ups that were needed. Next is to print out your assets, as we're about to start cutting them out. This can be tedious, depending on how complex your images are. For the fonts, I went with rough rectangles around each letter. In my opinion, imperfections are what really make these special. Getting perfect 90 degree cuts all the way around wasn't something I was too worried about. For the images, however, I wanted exact cutouts. And this definitely takes more time, and having something like a craft knife definitely helps a ton. But just like digital masking, the more time you spend and the more effort you put, the better the final product. You know, if you think about it, this is like masking in real life. Now that we have our assets cut out, we need to capture and process them. This is where controlling your variables can be very helpful. I've seen some tutorials on how to make these crumple animations where they cut everything out in Photoshop, but because I have so many to do and I want to avoid any extra steps, I bought a couple colored paper backgrounds. This is so when I bring everything into After Effects, I can easily key out the background. Think like a green screen. Having different colors allows me to swap the background in case I'm working with an image that blends in too much. I set up my light and camera on my C-stand, but you can definitely do this with way less. It could be just as simple as a light and a tripod, or even actually holding your camera for each shot if you're really steady. And when we get to processing later, you'll see an alternative way to prep your images that actually doesn't require any green screening. Okay, got the lighting set up, got the green paper set up, and just doing some focus tests. Uh, I gotta make sure it works first. For camera settings, I set my camera to shoot only JPEGs, no RAW. It isn't necessary for this kind of photo shoot and would only give me more files to swim through later. Also, everything is set to manual, including white balance. This will ensure consistency across all the images with exposure and color when we're processing later. Then it's just a matter of actually crumpling everything. This took a really long time for me since I had so many assets to process for the pack, but if you're doing just a handful for a specific project, you could get it done in a pretty short amount of time. Start with the subject uncrumpled, take a photo, crumple the edges slightly, take a photo, and repeat until you can't crumple anymore. You should hopefully be able to get about four to six frames per asset. And that's it. It's time to take the rest of the steps into After Effects. All right, we have quite a lot to get into, so let's get right into processing these images. So what I have here is the already finished processed project file, but I'm gonna use this and we're gonna do a couple from scratch just so you can see the entire workflow of how I did it and some tips and tricks on how to actually process this. The first thing we're gonna do here is make a new composition. So I'm gonna click the little new comp button down here and we're gonna call this example one a, just like so. And I'm gonna make the composition 1200 by 1200. And the frame rate doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm gonna go with 24 because that's what I did the whole pack in, but you could do 25, you could do 30, whatever you want. What really matters is the actual images, which we'll get into in a moment. But for this, we're gonna do 24, and I'll just set it to three seconds for this composition. I'm gonna click okay, and we'll have our new composition made here. I have them organized by subfolder here. So each of the fonts by alphabet, numbers, and special characters. So if we toggle down here, you'll see all these different images. And for these, I did five frames. So I know every five frames like this will be one letter. So we're gonna start actually with the A here. I'm gonna select the first five and drop them into our example one right here. Now, what I chose to do was have it be three frames 
per image, and then the last one holds to the end. You could do two frames, but you'll see later when we actually use it in the animation that it kind of doesn't really matter because we can adjust the speed to make it faster or slower if we want. But for this, I'm just gonna stick with what I did in the actual pack, which is three frames per. So after I drag all of these in, uh, what we can see here is if I just drag all of these to the side, you can see it's frame by frame. Each is what we captured before. What we wanna do here is chop these down here and leave the last one at the top because this is our first frame, this is our last frame. So I'm gonna select all of these. I'm gonna hit Shift Control D or it'd be Shift Command D on Mac. And I'm gonna delete these right here. So now we have three frames for each of these and then our final frame like this. Now, you can manually click and drag. So I could click and drag this over here and then hold down Shift and select this and click and drag it over here and do it like this. You could do it manually, that's totally fine. But in my case, since I had a lot, there's two different, slightly faster ways to do it. So the first way is just built into After Effects where if you select from the bottom to the top and you right click and come to Keyframe Assistant, there's a Sequence Layers option. If you click this, it'll bring up a pop-up. All you have to do is click OK, make sure overlap is unchecked, just click OK, and it'll sequence them just like so. And if we play through, we can see we have our little stop motion animation done on the A. Now, the way that I did it, it's a little bit faster, is using a free plugin from the Creative Dojo. I highly recommend getting it. I always have it docked over here in my bottom right. It's essentially the same thing, and it has a couple other benefits included, which we'll use later in the uh, in the animation part. But for this, it actually has a sequence layers option. So if you select sequence layers and go by select it and set the offset to zero, which is the amount of space between each layer. We want zero frames between each layer. And then we do it again. So if I just select like this and click stagger, it'll do it and it's a lot faster than the other option. So either works, you can do it manually or that way. Anyway, we now have this laid out. And again, if we play through, we can see we essentially have our A pretty much done here. The only thing we have left to do is a little bit of cleanup here on positioning, sort of like stabilizing the animation because if I play through, you can see it kind of moves around a bit. What I'm gonna do here is just go frame by frame and kind of adjust and click the frames and just kind of move it as needed. So I need to move a little to the right here we can see that it needs a little bit of rotation. So I'm gonna hit W for the rotation key and just rotate it slightly to the left. And we can see now we're a lot closer than before. And if I hit V to go back to the normal mouse tool, we can go to the frame before and do the same thing, kind of drag it over. And you can see that this is just a matter of messing around. You don't have to be this picky, but uh, yeah, now we're looking a little bit more stable. Let's do this last frame over here. That's pretty good. And then the middle one doesn't really matter as long as it's centered. So there we go. Now when we hit play, we can see we have our animation. And now we're actually ready to just get into cutting out the background. So you could do that fully in this composition. You could make a new adjustment layer like this and use key light or any other keying software to get rid of the green. But what I'm gonna do here is actually pre-comp this and we're gonna work on the composition. And you'll see why in a little bit why I did that. So I'm just gonna select all of these, the top one to the bottom. I'm gonna right click and go to pre-compose and we'll call this example one A and just click okay, and now we have a pre-comp. The keying plugin that I use regularly is called Primat Keyer, it's from Red Giant. But in this case, I wanna show that you can do it totally in After Effects with key light, it's just a little bit less control, but it is definitely possible. Uh, along with some other helpful tools that are built into After Effects to help clean up the key. So yeah, let's just get right into doing that. So the first thing is let's bring up key light. And when I do this, we can see that nothing happens. All we need to do on the screen color here is select the eyedropper and then select our green here. And we can see that it's keyed out the green. Now, if I toggle transparency, we can see that we actually have a transparent background. But if I zoom in here, you can see there's some issues on the edges over here. There's like a little bit of a shadow on the side and it's actually not the perfectly cleanest key. So if we go to the screen mat, we can see that there's actually, if I zoom in really close here, there's actually some artifacts in here. So we have to do a little bit of cleanup and we can see that also the A is here. It hasn't fully selected this. What I'm gonna do is bring on a levels and toggle down from RGB to alpha. And we can see here, as I start to clamp it in, the edges get a little bit sharper. If I pull this over, you can see the edge is getting sharper. And so there we go. Now we have a little bit of a cleaner key on the edges here, um, but it is still a little fuzzy and I'm not loving that. So I'm gonna do a couple more adjustments on the edges here but I'm also gonna bring on another effect, which is, well, there's two actually that you could use here. There's Simple Choker and there's Matte Choker. And Simple Choker, all it does is just expand or contract your edges. But the one I actually wanna use here is essentially the same thing, but with a little bit more control called Matte Choker. And it has a few more options. And you know, there's no specific value that I could tell you to do for this. It's mostly just messing around with the, uh, the first and the second set of options. So you can see there's three ones and three twos here. It's just a matter of messing around with the softness and how much you wanna actually bring it in. And uh, I think that's pretty solid. We have a pretty solid cleanup here. You could also bring on something else like roughen edges if you wanna add a little bit of extra roughening to the edges. So 
toggling this on and off, we can see we have a little bit of a different look. I'd rather not, I think it's good as is. But now when we scrub through, we gotta make sure that all of this is clean. Now there's a couple things here on the beginning. If I turn off the effects, we can see we're chopping a little bit into the actual paper, just because there's some green spill on the side here. So, you know, we can do some manual tweaking, change uh, in the screen mat and key light. We can actually change this to be a little bit wider and then make sure that the rest of it looks okay. So in here, I'd probably go back and change the matte choker. That's essentially the workflow for this. If you are using the green screen or any color key in the background, I'll get to in a moment using Roto and masking it out in case you wanna go through that route. But looking at the actual final example from the A that I did, uh, what you can also add at the end, like what I did here is I added a levels just to increase the contrast a little bit, bring in the white, make it look a little bit nicer. And then finally a tint to remove any color cast on the image. So if I turn this off, you can see there's a little bit of a green cast on the edges, but if I turn on tint, because this is all black and white, it gets rid of that. I wanna show one more thing here with the butterfly asset, uh, which is how to fix some problems you might run into. So I'm gonna turn on the keying, but we still have that blue. And so there's a couple main ways that you could get rid of this. There's actually an effect built in After Effects called spill suppressor. So if we bring this up and type in spill suppressor, you can change the color to whatever it is that your background is. So if I just sample this to the background, and turn our effects back on, we can see that it's kind of getting rid of the blue. What you could also do, which I think is a little bit better in this case, is just throw on a hue and saturation effect right here and then select whatever channel you need to. So if you're doing a green key, you could select the greens. In our case, this one's blue. So just select the blue and then just bring the saturation down to zero. And it keeps all the other colors intact. So all the oranges and stuff from the butterfly here intact but removes that blue. So we're at a nice clean, neutral black and white on the paper with all the colors here. And this is why it's important if you are keying to make sure you have a nice contrasty background. So in this case, I made sure to use a blue background because the butterfly is orange, just so it's way easier to key in the processing step here. And then finally, what I have here is just the levels to increase that contrast. All right, I have here the actual DaVinci Resolve asset from the pack. And what I actually did for the final is use Roto for this. Because if you notice here, even though I had different options for the color backgrounds, this has kind of a greenish tone, blue, and red, so I couldn't use any of the backgrounds. And so instead, I went with a dark background, so I just used my mouse pad as the background, but you could use anything else, just something that's dark and contrasty, and did the same layout that I did before with the A. Uh, what I then did is just brought it into another comp and did a little bit of a different workflow for this. And I'm gonna remove the Roto brush. We're gonna do this from scratch. So this is basically just pre-comping it. I'm then gonna come up here to the Roto brush tool, select it and make sure that we're set to full, because it's important to be on full when you're using the Roto brush. And I'm gonna double click on the layer itself, and it'll bring up the actual Roto menu here. I'm gonna start from the end and move backwards. So we're gonna start with the first one right here. I'm gonna click and drag inside here and try and keep it as clean as possible. Just going around the circle. We can always add more after, but just doing our best to stay inside the lines. And we'll see that we need to add some here in the middle. And we can see here over on this preview with the transparency toggled on, if you have the transparency toggled on, we can see the edges. Now we can just move backwards and see if we need to do any cleanup. You can see here there are some chattering edges here, some dark edges from the background. That's not a big deal. We can fix that later with matte choker or some of the actual rotor brush effects here. So I'm not worried about that too much. I'm just gonna try and do a little bit of cleanup, uh, holding down Alt or Option on Mac, just doing some general cleanup. Doesn't need to be exact. Uh, on this frame, we can see that there's quite a bit. So I'm gonna hold down that uh, Alt key. Now, if you don't see the freeze button, just click and drag this over to the left you can see the little freeze button here. This will essentially lock in what we just did. So I'm gonna click this and I'll fast forward and we'll come back after this finishes. All right, and if I hit play, we can see we have the animation. We can go ahead and close this out because we don't need the roto anymore. Swap back to our normal mouse tool and hit play just to see this. I'm also gonna swap to full quality so we can see this properly. And we can see that it looks really solid. Like I mentioned before, we still have these edges to clean up, but that's no big deal because in the actual roto brush effect here, we can shift the edge negative to the left and that'll kind of eat in those little edges. You could also feather it more if you want. So if we turn off the transparency, we can see like if I crank this up a lot, you can see it's very feathered. I think it was actually good at default, just a five. So you can see that you don't actually need to do the king. You could do roto and you could even do this with masks. If you take the mask tool instead, so if I delete the Roto brush tool, you know, you could manually do some masking around the edge. Obviously that takes a lot longer, but a couple different options for how you could isolate these. That's really it for processing them. What I wanna show briefly is just how to output these because that is important. Of course, if you're doing this in an animation, you could just bring this composition into your animation. But if you wanna save this for later, like you're making assets for yourself or something like that, then all you need to do is in your composition, select Control M or Command M on Mac to add it to the render queue. You can see I have a ton already done in here. We're gonna leave it on best settings. And we're gonna open this here 
and drop it down to QuickTime. And if we open the format options, I'm gonna change this to ProRes 4444 right here. The reason we're choosing this codec is because it's the perfect balance between quality and it allows alpha, whereas like MP4, you can't preserve alpha in that. This one you can, and it doesn't get to astronomically large file sizes. So I'm gonna click OK. And then under video output, make sure that RGB plus alpha is selected, not just RGB, because we do wanna save this alpha. Select that, yeah, we'll just turn off the audio as well because there's no audio, it doesn't really matter, but that's it, and then click OK, and then you could select where you wanna render it, and just click the render button, and you're good to go. You have your asset saved. Okay, just before I get into recreating this, which I'm gonna show from the ground up how I made, all with assets from the pack, I wanna show just a couple cool tricks that you can use with the actual assets to get more out of them. The first thing I think is probably the most important one to know, which is how to extend out the layer beyond just the three seconds that we rendered. So if I hit play here, we can see that it holds for up to three seconds, but then disappears. Now, of course, you could just duplicate this and kind of trim this and, and do it this way. There's a much more efficient way to do this. What I'm actually gonna do here is just right click and come to time and then freeze on last frame. And what it'll do is it'll let it play out and then extend out for infinity, for as long as you want, all in the same layer. So you don't need to pre-compose, you don't need to do any extra freeze framing on this, it's all on one layer, which makes it really nice. Also, if you wanna reverse it, so if you want it to uncrumple and then maybe go back down and, and crumple again, is if you just select these and we hit Control C and Control V to paste or Command C, Command V on Mac, and we right click the keyframes here and come down to time reverse, we can now see that it uncrumples. And we actually don't need the keyframes to be this long. We could actually just make one right before it starts right here like this and delete this one. And now these two keyframes right here, we can click and drag to wherever we want and it'll now uncrumple. So if I bring this over here, let's let it play out. It'll hold for a bit. And then once it crosses this keyframe, it'll start its unanimation. So yeah, really easy way to control this in After Effects. Let me show the exact same thing in Premiere. It's slightly different, but the concept is, is pretty much the same. What I'm gonna do is just hit my C key to cut. I'm gonna cut this section right here, and then I'm gonna right click this and just add a frame hold. And now we can extend this out to however long we want. And of course, now it'll be frozen for as long as you want. And it's the same thing as before. We just take this beginning bit. I'm gonna hold down Alt or Option on Mac and click and drag and let go here. We've now made a copy of the beginning. If we come over here, we can see that it just starts again. But if we right click and go to speed slash duration and just select reverse speed like this, it'll now do the same thing that we just did. So if I hit play, we can see that it now crumples out. So opens, holds, and then at the end here, crumples down. Lastly, I have the same thing here in Resolve where it just opens up. I'm gonna do the same thing I did in Premiere. I'm going to hit B for the cut tool, click it here, and then right click, change clip speed, and then select freeze frame. And now, of course, we can do this, just extend it out and it'll be frozen. And it's the same thing as before, just holding down Alt or Option on Mac to make a copy, drop it over here. Then we right click, change clip speed, and we can select reverse speed. And it'll do the same thing we just saw. So if I play, we'll see it crumples down. And there you go you have your reverse and freeze frame on all of these. Now, we're gonna be mostly focusing here in After Effects because this is where we're animating, we have the most control, but yeah, that's the way to do it if you're using another editing application and not After Effects. A couple more things that we could do here is of course, if we right click this and we go to transform, we can flip it horizontal. So we want the car pointing left instead of right or any of the other assets, there's some pencils and pens, you could flip those. You could also hue shift this. So if we bring up the normal hue and saturation effect built in After Effects, select our cyan's here and we shift the hue, we can see we're changing the color of the car. So now we have a greenish tone car. We can change the saturation as well as the feathering. If you want to bring this over, this will just, you know, select more of the colors. Might make a little bit of a nicer selection. Also really important to the Ali Abdal look for his shorts is the wiggle. And so I'm going to show a couple ways to do this. The first way is to do it directly on the layer controls. So if I hit P to open up the position, and I hold down Alt or Option on Mac and click the stopwatch, we're gonna bring up our expression here. And I'm gonna type in just the basic, you've probably seen this before, but I'm gonna type in the basic wiggle expression. We're gonna do something really, really high, like 200 and something like five. If I hit play, we can see this shaking quite a bit. It's shaking every single frame, the amount that we set. So I'm gonna bring this up to 20, so we can see it a little bit more clearly. We see that's ridiculous. We definitely don't want this look. But if we go to the beginning and hit return and add a line here, posterize time, and then set it to something like four and add a semicolon to make sure that our line breaks. And now we hit play, 
it'll do it every four frames. And now it looks a lot more like the Ollie look, more that hand-drawn kind of imperfect look. Um, you could of course change the frame amount. So this is how many times a second that it does this. So if we set it to 12, you can say it's a lot faster, it's definitely too fast, but you can do something like five or six, whatever you feel fits for your animation. But I'm gonna set this back to four, and then I'm gonna right click the position right here and select copy expression only. This is a nice little hidden thing that makes it easy to copy expressions. And then let's go to our rotation. So I'm gonna hit shift R to also bring up our rotation and then just select our rotation and hit control V or command V on Mac. And we'll see that we've now pasted the same expression on our rotation. Now. The reason it's rotating too much is because if we toggle this down, we can see that we're rotating at 20, but in this case, it's not 20 like position, it's 20 degrees, which is way too much. So I'm actually just gonna change this 20 down to something like three works, and there we go. We have a little bit of a jitter here. Now we could leave it as that, right? And this totally works, and that's a great way of doing it. But I'm gonna show one thing that will make this a little bit easier if you're working with a lot of assets and you wanna copy and paste it a little bit easier. Because of course, like I said, you could right click the position and copy the expression and then paste it to other layers as well. But there's a slightly simpler and easier way once you set it up and you could save it as an animation preset, which we're gonna do right now. So I'm gonna hold down Alt and just deselect these, take off the expressions entirely. We're back to nothing at all. And I'm gonna bring on the transform effect. We're gonna set up a couple expressions in this. So if I hold the Alt or Option key and press the position here, we're gonna add an expression here. Now, what is this expression that we're actually adding? Well, if we look at the value here, this number right here, we can see that this value is actually half of our actual car. So if I go into our project panel over here where the car is and we look at the actual value, we see it's 2382 by 914. Well, this value here, 1191 by 457 is exactly half that. The reason we're adding an expression here is because every asset is a little bit different, but we know that the transform effect will always place the position marker in the middle, which is half of the width and the height. So we're going to write an expression to always do that. So this is the expression we're going to type. We're gonna type h for height is equal to this layer dot height divided by two and add a semicolon and this will be our first variable and then w for width. We're gonna do w equals this layer dot width divided by two, add a semicolon. So we're basically again calling half of the width and half of the height here. I'm then gonna go down two and I'm gonna open the brackets and just type w for width because that's the first comma h. When we click away, we'll see that nothing's happened because it's actually just set it to this. So if we do plus 100, you'll see that we've added 100. So it's actually, it is driving this exactly as we want. Next, what we're gonna do, because we do wanna add the wiggle, is next to our brackets here, I'm gonna go plus our wiggle expression. So we're gonna do the same wiggle expression from before. We'll do something like 200 and maybe 20 should work. And then if we click away, we can see that it kind of jumps over here because what we still need to add is subtracting the value and then add a semicolon and it'll put it back to the middle. And so now we have our wiggle expression in the middle with the width and height automatically determined based on the actual layers width and height. Of course, we're missing that posterized time. So I'm gonna add it right before here. Let's do our posterized time and set this to four. Make sure we have that semicolon. And now we have that wiggle on this as well. So the last thing I'm gonna do here for the position part is just make sure that the anchor point option here in transform is the same without that wiggle expression. So I'm gonna hold down alt or option on Mac select our anchor point. And what we can actually do here is if we just toggle open our transform and go to our position, we can just copy all of this, click right here and paste it, and then just remove our wiggle option. And even the posterized time, we don't actually need that. All we need to make sure is that this is set to half the width and half the height, because again, it depends on the layer that, that we're using. That all sounds great, but it would be nice to actually see this in action. So we bring in our sunflower here. I have the other asset here and I copy over our transform and paste it onto our sunflower, we can see that the values are completely different. This one is 800, it's in the 800s, right? Whereas our car is in 1100s and 400s, but because we set it to half the width and height of the actual layer, instead of set values, it auto adjusts depending on our actual layer. And this is really great when you're working with a lot of different assets, especially from the pack, just so you can process it a little bit faster. Back to just our car, we're gonna finish this up here. We're gonna add the same expression to the rotation, but a little bit simpler. We don't need to do actually that much of a setup on this. I'm gonna hold down Alt or Option on Mac, click the stopwatch on rotation. It'll bring up our expression. And all we need to do is this, just the same default one. There's no position or variables needed in this. We're gonna do posterize time set to four, add our semicolon, bump down a line and type in wiggle 200, something like two. And there we go. Now we have a little bit of rotation on this as well as the position. 
And so again, you could copy paste this onto any other asset, but what's even easier is if you don't wanna to have to go back and forth to copy paste, what you can actually do here is if you select the effect here, so I deleted the hue and saturation, but I'm just selecting the transform effect. I'm gonna go up to animation at the top and I'm gonna select save animation preset. And in our user presets here, we can actually save this as whatever we want. So we can call this up from our effect panel later and it'll just instantly drop on exactly with our expressions. So I'm gonna name this transform and we'll just add something like crumpled paper preset like that, just so when we call it up, we know exactly what it is and hit save and there we go. Now the way to make sure that this shows up in your effects panel, if we open our effects and presets panel over here, if you click the little hamburger icon over here and refresh the list and go into our animation presets, in our user presets, we see we have the transform crumpled paper preset. Now in my case, I use FX console, which is that free third party plugin to bring up effects, which you've seen a couple times in this video. If I hit control space here to bring it up, and I hit this the gear icon to refresh it, click okay, and then do it one more time and we type transform like that. We can see at the bottom, we have our crumpled paper preset, which if I click, it'll bring up that exact same transform thing. We can see that our actual uh, expressions were baked into this. Now, anytime that we add it onto an asset, it has that already made. We don't have to retype that every single time. All right, I think that's enough of the explanation of how to actually process these. Let's get into actually making the animation finally. Our goal is to recreate this here. So let's just get right into it. So I already made a new composition here. The first thing, I brought in all the fonts in here and we're gonna work with font one for now. So I brought in the alphabet and what I'm gonna do here is just select the letters that I need. We're gonna drag all of these into here. Let's go to the end here and I'm gonna right click and do what we did before. We're gonna go to time and freeze on last frame. And this will just give us extra freedom after those three seconds. Let's also select all of them and scale them down to let's say 30%. And now we're gonna start laying them out. Now we could just randomly guess. I could bring these over and start guessing where they go. But a really easy way to do this is actually just to right click and let's make a new text layer and type in asset creation and we can't actually see this. So let's set this to just a color. This is just gonna be a placeholder for now. The font itself doesn't actually matter, but this is just so we could space out our letters at the beginning. So I'm gonna scale this up to something like this and center it in our composition. And now let's bring this to the bottom and we can actually just drag our letters over. And so this will just help spacing a little bit. So let's actually duplicate our S, space this out. And you can see all I'm doing here is just kind of placing them roughly where they go. We're gonna adjust that in a minute anyway. So we now need another E. So I'm gonna to go to this first E and copy it paste it here and just continue this until we have all our letters placed. Okay, we have the letters roughly placed. I'm gonna delete our actual reference layer and then I'm gonna hold down Alt or Option and select the quotation mark key. And this will bring up our green grid. I use this all the time. And we're actually pretty centered already. I don't think we need to change it too much, but this might help in case maybe your character is a little bit to the side or not perfectly centered. This is just a really nice way to, uh, to center your elements here. Let's also maybe adjust these a little bit. Let's move this one up, this one down a bit, kind of make them imperfect. We don't want this to be exactly perfect. That's that's not the whole point of these uh, paper letters. Again, we're gonna add that transform jitter that we made before. So it'll kind of do that for us anyway, but this just kind of starts us uh, in that direction. If we take off our grid and we hit play, we can now see that we have this playing. But in my opinion, it's a little bit slow and I would actually rather this be a little bit faster. What I made for the pack here is have it be three frames before the next frame, but I actually wanna make this faster. So I'm gonna select all of them, holding down shift and select all of them. And I'm gonna open up this button in the bottom left, which is the expander collapse, the in out duration stretch option, this one right here. And I'm gonna select just any one of them here where it says stretch and set it to two thirds of the speed. And this will basically shrink it in to be faster. So I'm just gonna type in 66.6 .6 a whole bunch of times and hit enter. And now when we go frame by frame, we have two frames each. So this just makes it a little bit faster. All right, I'm clicking this to toggle that down because we don't need it for now. Okay, that's good. Let's actually start changing the colors of these. And so if we go back to our reference, what I made already, we can see I have these kind of like random colors for each of them, which is very reminiscent of like a sort of like old ransom note uh, which is actually where I got the reference from. So if I pull up Google here and I bring this over, you can see this is actually what I used as a reference. I just use Google image for the colors. And all I did is just sample some of the colors from some of these different notes. You could choose any two colors for them. The easiest way to do that is with just a tint effect. So I'm gonna bring up FX console and type in tint. And now we can select for the black color and the white color, anything. And what I'm doing here is if you notice, I have the window open on the left. All I'm doing is I'm selecting the eyedropper 
hovering over the color and hitting enter or return on Mac instead of clicking. Because if I click it, then it'll actually click over to Google. But if I hit enter, it'll select the color without me swapping over to Google. And it's just a quick way of selecting your colors if you're using the eyedropper with a reference outside of After Effects. Let's do the same on the white here. So I'm gonna select the white and select our color. And then I'm just gonna repeat this for all the different letters here. Okay, after some selecting and swapping colors, I think this is pretty good. Of course, we could always change it later, but I'm gonna just leave it like this for now. But if we go back to here, you might notice that I used some of the other fonts as well to kind of mix it up and give it a little bit more variation, which really helps sell it. So I actually have the other fonts from the pack as well, from the full pack here, and I'm just gonna go through and swap them. There's actually a really easy way to swap assets and to keep the effects without having to redo everything. So what I'm gonna do here is select our first S, and go into our second font and find the S here. And before selecting this, I'm gonna hold down Alt or Option on Mac, and I'm gonna click and drag, still holding Alt, and drop this onto our S. And you can see that it auto swaps the S, but it keeps the tint, it keeps the scale, it keeps the position, keeps everything. And I'm just gonna repeat that for some of the different letters, mixing up the third font as well, and I'll just repeat this for the rest of the letters. So comparing the two, uh, they're slightly different. It shows slightly different colors and the different letters, but it kind of goes to show it doesn't really matter um, just as long as you keep that variation and, and mix up the colors and everything. It should look pretty good. So we're off to a good start here. If I hit play, we have our animation in, but uh, not a lot of uh, character to it yet, except for the color. Well, it's time we bring in that jitter that we made before, that actual preset that we made. So I'm going to select our first one, our A, and I'm going to bring up our FX console and type in transform. We can see we have our preset down here, and if I click this, it auto adds it with the updated anchor point, position and rotation that we set before. If I hit play, we can now see that the A is jumping around. So all we need to do here is just select our transform, hit control C and select the rest and just hit control V. It'll auto paste them. And now when we hit play, we have this on our animation. We have these nice little jitters. Um, and of course, if you wanna change the values, it's actually really simple. So I'm gonna select our A right here. Maybe I wanna add a little bit more, more rotation to this. So I'm gonna actually select our A and hit UU twice to bring up all our expressions and come down to our rotation expression. And I'm gonna update this from two to actually, let's make it five for this. I think five would be better for this to get, add a little bit more character to it. Well, it's only updated one of them, but what we can do is just easily override our transform effect by selecting our A's transform copy it again and select the rest and paste and it'll override those with that new expression updated and now when we hit play we have a little bit more rotation on this and so if you want to go back and forth and kind of update maybe the position or whatever else that's a great way to quickly update it and that's also part of why i use the transform effect instead of the actual layer controls because uh, it'd be a little bit more time to go through and update those let's zoom in here and let's change the scale a little bit let's scale this one up maybe scale this one down just to add a little bit more variety on them when we zoom back out here, we now have a little bit more variation on this. And again, of course, you can always just change the actual position of these. So we wanna space them out a little bit more. There really are no rules to what to do here. It's really just a matter of experimentation. But let's actually bring in a background here. I have a 10K scan of a piece of paper, an actual just plain white piece of paper. Now we have a little bit more of a paper vibe going on. I'm also gonna drop this down to quarter quality just so that it loads a little bit faster as we're working. Let's also color code each of our words here. So I'm gonna select asset and change this to green and select creation and set this to fuchsia just so that we see it a little bit easier in our timeline here. Now, one thing I did here for this is I actually offset them randomly. So if you look here, for the different letters, they're kind of like shifted randomly. And the way I did that is actually with Dojo Shifter, the plugin I mentioned before, the free one from Creative Dojo, I highly recommend it. They actually have, if we change the options to offset layers and change it from selected to random, and then input a value, something like one, when we select all of our layers and click stagger, it'll offset them randomly. So when we hit play, we now have them kind of come in randomly. And I didn't actually love how it randomized this, so I'm gonna actually undo this with Control-Z or Command-Z on Mac and just click stagger again, and it'll give us a new randomness. And you could just keep doing that until it comes up with something you like. Of course, you could also manually do it, just kind of shifting the layers, but this just kind of helps automate that a little bit faster. Okay, next we have our part one text right here. So I'm gonna go over here and select from our font two. I brought in a couple of the numbers as needed, A, P, R, T, as well as the one for part one. And I wanna click and drag this and drop this on top. We're gonna to do the same thing as before. I'm gonna right click this, time, freeze on last frame. We can now scale this down to something like 15% because we want it to be a lot smaller and bring this up and start spacing these out. Now, before we do that, I actually want to just invert this. So I'm gonna click invert 
And now we have this as the opposite colors. And then let's also add a levels effect to make this a little bit brighter on the letter, just so it's a little bit more like white. And I'm gonna bring over this bottom one here to make it more of like a grayish tone rather than a straight black. I think a grayish tone looks a little bit nicer. And we can select both of these, the invert and the levels, hit Control C, select the rest of ours and hit Control V and it'll paste them underneath. And now we have this color font. So we can start to lay these out. Now, if we zoom back out, and we bring up that grid again, so holding down Alt or Option and hitting the quotation mark button, we can see we're not quite centered. So I'm gonna select all of these and kind of just shift this over until the spacing on this side matches roughly the spacing on this side. So coming back out to the full screen, let's get rid of our grid. And let's make sure that we actually paste that same transform. I'm gonna copy this from one of our letters and I'm gonna paste this on our part one as well. And so now when we hit play, we can see that it has it on part one as well. We can also add the randomizing on the staggering. So select all them, hit stagger, and there we go. We now have them staggered out like that. The last main thing we're gonna do with the assets here is add those butterflies and the trails behind the butterflies before we do some final stylizing, overlay textures, and some extra bits at the end, like a vignette. But first, the butterfly. So I'm gonna go over here into our project panel and select the butterfly and just drag this down here. And let's change this color label to purple just so we can see it a little bit easier in the composition and do the same thing that we've been doing with all of these. I'm gonna right click this, go to time, freeze on last frame, and let's scale this down to something a lot smaller. Something like that should be pretty good. And our goal is to kind of have it explode out from the middle. Let's just start it somewhere like here. So I'm gonna hit P to open up the, the position properties of the butterfly. I'm gonna add a keyframe right at the beginning of it, move forward a bit, maybe like roughly a second or so, and let's drag this up over here like that. Let's also hold down Shift and R to open up rotation as well. I'm gonna add a keyframe on rotation, bring this back to the beginning, and then let's rotate it roughly, something like that should be pretty good. It doesn't need to be exact. Right now, if we solo our butterfly and we hit play, we can see that it just kind of goes really linear and it looks pretty terrible, but we're gonna fix that. Let's actually select all the keyframes here and hit F9 to easy ease. We're gonna come over to our speed graph and make sure we're on the speed graph here. I'm gonna select the beginning ones, bring it over so it starts fast and kind of eases out like so. When we hit play, we can see that it kind of explodes out more like that. So let's add a little bit of an arc to this path as well. I'm gonna hit the G key, which is actually the pen tool, but it works on position keyframes. When I hover over it, you can see it's a little carrot uh, icon right now. If I just click and drag this, we can actually change the bezier of our actual uh, curve here to something like this. We could do it on the other point as well. If we wanna do something like an S curve, but in this case, I think something like this is pretty good and maybe also increase that rotation just a little bit more so it lines up like so. And now when we hit play, we have the butterfly coming out just like that. We're still gonna add the jitter preset that we made before, but in this case, the only thing I wanna add on position and rotation is a little bit of a posterized time. So I'm gonna hold down Alt or Option. I feel like by this point, you probably know what we're about to do. Let's click position and let's just add a posterized time and let's set this to six and add a semicolon. Now, if I click away, you'll see there's an error because it doesn't actually know what it's posterizing. So all we need to do is just add another line and type in value and it'll fix it. And so let's copy this, right click position, copy expression only, go to rotation and paste it. And now when we hit play, we have that go a little bit more jittery. It kind of lines up better with the style that we're going with. One more trick that we could do here actually is if we select our position keyframe, the second one right here, and come over to our speed graph and lift this off from zero to something like 37 is pretty good. And then we change our expression from value to instead loop out continue like so. When we hit play, we can see that the butterfly actually continues in the direction that it was already going. And that's a cool little trick I actually use all the time. Loop out continue is a nice little trick where if you add the modifier continue, it'll take the velocity of the last keyframe and continue it out for all infinity. And if you want a little bit more control and actually changing that value, instead of just guessing in the speed graph here, is if you actually right click the keyframe and come over to keyframe velocity, you can see that number is right here. We can change it to whatever we want. So we could change it to, I'll just change it to something like 100 so you could see a little bit more extreme. And we can see that it's going a lot faster now. I think 37 was pretty good. We'll just leave it like that. But it kind of adds a little bit more ambient motion after it finishes out. Okay, let's add that preset that we made before. I'm just gonna select the A, select our transform and copy it and then paste it on our butterfly layer. And we'll see that all of that jitter and rotation kind of adds in there. And let's actually unsolo this and see what it looks like in the rest of the composition. So when we hit play, we have the butterfly kind of coming out from here. All right, let's duplicate our butterfly and we're gonna scoot this over a little bit and we're gonna adjust the values here. So I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time 
and kind of scoot things over. I'm gonna move the butterfly over here, change some of the position values. And when I hit play, we can see that we have two different butterflies. I'm gonna do one more butterfly and I'll see you after adding that. Okay, you can see we have the three butterflies done. I just wanna point out one thing is that when you are actually changing the values of the position and everything, just make sure that the playhead is over the keyframes because if you're not, and I try and move this, it'll actually add a new keyframe, which is not what we want here. Just a little tip in case you're having some issues with that. If we clean up our composition here and click play, we can now see we have the three butterflies coming out just like that. What we can do next now is actually change the color of these, which is what we did before with the car. So I'm gonna bring up a hue and saturation here, and I'm just gonna select the reds. And let's just shift the hue over to something like this pinkish tone, this maybe pink purple tone, looks pretty good. Let's copy this hue and saturation and do it on the second one. And let's make this one green instead. So just shift this over to green. And now just like that, we have three completely different butterflies with literally just one effect that takes two seconds to do. Next thing I'm gonna do is add those trails. All I'm gonna do here is right click and make a new shape layer. And I'm gonna use the pen tool and select roughly the position that we had before. So if we look at this arc here, it starts over here at the E and goes over to this point. If I bring up the grid, we can have that as kind of a reference when we draw our line. So I'm just gonna start it here at the E and bring it over to here. It doesn't need to be perfect. We can adjust it later. Let's rename this to trail one. And let's actually open this up and go down into the contents, into shape. We can delete the fill, open the stroke here, and we're gonna click on dashes. We're gonna click the plus icon twice. If we zoom in over to our dashes and we set this to full, we can see we've actually made a dashed line. So if I make this a little bit thicker, we can see it a little bit easier. I'm gonna increase these values until it's something a little bit closer to what I want. I think that's pretty good. So let's drop this back down to something like four. And now all we need to do is add a trim paths to this. And trim paths just draws out our line. So on the trim paths, if I open this, we're gonna set a keyframe on end. And if we open up our butterfly, the one that we're actually referencing, if I select this and select U to open up the keyframes, we're gonna move this end keyframe over to this spot right here where it actually ends. So we have the same exact timing. And I'm gonna come back to the beginning here and drop this end value down to zero. So we have it kind of drawing out with it. And so if I click away and let's hide the grid because we don't need that anymore. If I drag through, you can see the dotted line is kind of following the butterfly. But of course the pacing is wrong because we need to do some easing in the speed graph. So I'm gonna select both of these and hit F9. Come over to our speed graph here and do the same easing that we did before in the butterflies. Bring it over to the left and then bring this one all the way over to the left like that so it has a really nice strong easing. And when we follow it through here, if I click away, you can see that it pretty closely follows. What we still need to add is that posterized time that we did on the butterfly. So I'm gonna hold down alt or option and do the same thing as before, just type posterized time, six, and then value. And now when we scrub through, we can see that it keeps up with the butterfly just like so. And I have it as red here, which I kind of like. I did black in the original, but you could select a color. Um, I think for this, just for consistency sake, I'm just gonna set it to something like a gray to keep it a little bit more subtle. Coming back to full size and we hit play, we can see the dotted line follows behind it. Uh, we can also adjust here. If we select our layer and hit G for the pen tool, we can adjust it a little bit, maybe scoot it down a little bit so it's more centered with the butterfly. The last thing we need to do on this is just select our end, press Control C, and then select our start right here and paste it and it'll do the same exact keyframes with the expression already baked in, the one we just made. And when we hit play now, we can see that it draws and then undraws, because we don't want that trail to be there forever. What we need to do now is just add the trail for the other two, but it's the exact same process. So I'm gonna fast forward while I do that. Trails are done and they're all animated. All we have to do now is just a little bit of extra stylizing, just a little bit left to go. So I'm gonna do this in a little bit of a different way than the way I actually did it in the animation before. This way is actually a little bit more efficient. If I hit play, Let's find a length of the composition that we like. Something like that should be pretty good. So I'm gonna hit N on my keyboard to set the end time of the actual work area. And I'm gonna right click in this work area and trim the comp to that work area. And it'll just kind of clean up, get rid of the excess at the end. And it'll also clean up the ends of all of our layers here. So selecting all of our layers, except for the trails, I'm gonna pre-compose all of these. And we can call this paper assets pre and click OK. And now we can add a drop shadow to this. Now there's two main ways to add a drop shadow. Either way is totally fine. Just depends on how you wanna do it. There's the drop shadow effect and you can change the distance and the color and everything. And this totally works. The way I normally like to add drop shadow is actually through layer. Go down to layer styles and add drop shadow. And they're slightly different. It kind of has to do with the order of operations that After Effects processes these. In our case, it actually doesn't make a difference, but I'm just gonna use this one. But again, feel free to use either. It doesn't really matter. I'm gonna change some of the values increase the distance a little bit. 
Let's also lower the opacity to something like 35 and maybe drop the size down to zero. And let's change it to a nice bright blue like we had before, maybe something like this. When we hit play, we have all those drop shadows automatically added to our layers. Let's start adding in some final motion and some overlay textures so we can wrap this all up. So first, I'm gonna right click and make a new adjustment layer. And we're gonna bring on the transform effect. And let's start the scale a little bit wider because we have so much room from this gigantic paper asset, we can actually zoom out to something like 90. And let's start the scale right at the beginning. So let's keyframe the scale, move over to something like three seconds and increase this to like 112. If we open up our keyframes, let's select the both of them, hit F9, go over to our speed graph and let's ease this in just like so. So we want it to ease in and ease out so we get a nice snappy motion. When we hit play, we have that. Now it looks kind of funky because it's way too smooth for this style of animation. You can definitely guess what we're about to do. I'm gonna alt click our scale and type in posterize time. Let's set this to six, add another line, make sure we have value. When we hit play, we can see we now have that choppy zoom in that matches the rest of our animation. Uh, what I actually did is the same loop out continue. So I'm gonna type in loop out continue just like so. And then let's go back to our graph here and let's lift this a little bit off of the graph. And now we have that kind of scale up that continues through to the end of the animation. Just it's a little bit more ambient scale. Looks really nice for this. All right, let's add those textures in. So I'm gonna bring in those textures from the pack. I'm gonna use a couple of these. Let's bring in the first one here and let's set this to overlay. And you might be like, why would you do that? It just makes this really funky because what we're gonna do is first solo this and add a levels effect to this and scoot over the left arrow all the way to the right so that we have the full range here because we have nothing over here in information. We wanna make this as contrasty as possible. I'm then gonna bring in these two points towards the middle. So we're basically making this kind of like a middle gray uh, type of texture, which is really good for overlay. So now that we've done this, if we unsolo this, we can see once it updates, we now have this overlay texture on top of our letters and on top of everything. And it adds that nice little grit and grunge to our composition. Let's add another texture. Let's go to an O2 and drop this in. And I'm gonna set this one to overlay and do the same thing. I'm gonna actually copy the levels from before, paste it onto this and make a couple adjustments. Now we have this middle grade texture that adds a little bit more overlay variation to it. Let's also bring this below our adjustment layer so it scales up with everything and scale this up as well. And there we go. We see we have some of that nice overlay texture on top of everything. We're gonna do one more here. I'm gonna bring in 05, drop it under here. Let's make sure that we scale it up. I'm actually gonna set this one to multiply and bring up our levels again. But instead, this time we're gonna make it a little bit brighter. We don't wanna overexpose it too much and just kind of change the gamma a little bit and then lower the opacity. So T for opacity, let's drop the opacity down to like 40%. So it's a little bit more subtle. And now we have this paper texture here as well. All right, finally, the last couple effects we're gonna add onto the same adjustment layer that we made from before. I'm actually gonna use a vignette. Now I use normally the Sapphire plugin vignette, but you could use CC vignette, which just adds a vignette like this and you could change the amount. So let's drop it down to like 50, a little bit lighter, as well as a displacement map. And the reason we're adding a displacement map is we're gonna actually use one of the textures here to drive a little bit of the displacement. So by default, it's actually displacing kind of weird because we actually need to select the layer that we want it to look at. So I'm gonna select the first one and I'm gonna make sure that it reads the effects and mask. We want it to see the levels that we, we adjusted. We can actually, if I increase this to a lot higher, you can see we're actually displacing based on the texture. So I'm gonna drop this down to maybe something like 10, and 10 just to add a little bit of uh, paper grunge on the edge. And we could even add one more if we duplicate this and set it to one of the other ones like O2, just adds a little bit more displacement. And if we zoom out and play, you can see our final title animation for our video. Very similar to the one that I made from before. That's it. Now you know how to create this look from beginning to end. And as mentioned at the start of the video, there are a couple of links in the description to purchase the entire pack, which directly supports me. However, if you prefer to try it out first, one of the fonts is available in its entirety with a few of the images added in as an extra bonus. Either way, I hope you learned something from this video. And if you make anything, definitely tag me on X or Instagram at Skymography and show me what you do. All right, see you in the next one.